everybody. How's it going today? Thanks for watching. I'm in our uh, manure building here. I had to uh, put the camera up here the other day. It was Friday. It's uh, Monday here today, Monday evening. We were working on uh, swapping everything over from our south sand manure separator to our north sand manure separator. So all the, the incoming water hookups, the uh, hydrocyclone, the sump that comes off of those separators, we moved all that stuff over. And uh, don't remember exactly how much footage of that I got because it uh, was quite a long process and my battery died at some point. But I want to show you guys this here after we had that all done, kind of where the status is uh, tonight, tomorrow morning, we are going to work at getting that new sand manure separator in this building. Uh, it's going to be uh, quite a process, I think. We, uh, I'm behind the sand manure separators here at the moment, so there was a hole right there in the wall, kind of like there is there. So we closed that up and poured concrete in that this morning. So we are essentially uh, ready to get this uh, bigger separator in here. And it is a little bit loud in this building, so I'll. Uh, Try to talk as loud as I can, but just kind of quickly explain uh, what we're going to be doing here tomorrow before we get into the rest of the video. So what we were working on the other day was moving this sump and trommel over in line with the, that sand manure separator because that big one, that new one is going to be coming in right here and it comes all the way back to about here essentially. And then the uh, outlet will tie into that six inch right there. And then we moved that cyclone that was on top of this separator on top of that one. And for the most part, have that done. We are going to uh, run that eight inch pipe in through this trough into this pit. But for now we left it like this because we were in a little bit of a time crunch. I'll walk back over to the other side here so you guys can hear me better. But we started working on it at 11 and it was uh, two o'clock by the time we were done so we we start we're not milking between 11 11 15 and about quarter to one so for about an hour hour and 15 minutes of milking we didn't have this system running which uh, at that point the, the storage pit the reception pit was getting quite full so we were uh, done just in time essentially to be able to continue cleaning pens we didn't have to stop doing that but it was a uh, close close call there because this equipment essentially runs all the time when we're milking but i'll probably show us uh, setting that separator in place in the next video i want to talk about the genetic audit that we had done here the other day so i'll uh, head up to the office and we'll uh, talk about that here for the rest of this video Back in the office here now, I had uh, talked about this genetic audit that we had done here in the last video, I think, and just wanted to maybe uh, quickly touch on it or go over it, uh, talk about some of the highlights, and uh, kind of explain what it is, uh, I guess. So we, uh, years ago, probably about 10 years ago, we were doing genetic testing on all of our calves, and we had quit for a while and then started again probably about uh, four or five years ago or so now, I suppose. And uh, about two years ago, we started doing uh, genetic audits uh, through Zoetis, where they essentially what they're looking at is uh, the genetic improvement of your herd, areas of concern, and then also looking at the genetic testing results of the calves that we're testing, and then coming back and looking at how those calves are doing in the milking herd and how accurate were the genetic predictions of those calves as calves based on what their actual uh, what they actually did once they uh, got into the milking herd so essentially just looking at are those were those best calves as calves actually our best cows and uh pretty interesting actually there's some uh, pretty uh, strong results to indicate that breeding, uh, spending some money on genetics is uh, well worth it. And we'll just uh, kind of go over that here quickly. So uh, essentially we uh, are doing this once a year. So we're looking at the last 12 months of, uh, of cows and heifers. 
because they do look at the scours and respiratory the instances of scours and respiratory in calves but we'll just uh, kind of go over this report here quickly so we uh, currently have uh, first second and some third lactation cows that have results and then also some uh, older cows some sixth plus lactation sixth or seventh lactation there's not a lot of those cows with results but there is a handful and then uh, they look at uh, you know how strong is the bull lineup that we are using and have used in the last 12 months uh, how many hef how many heifers and cows that we're breeding to sorted semen versus beef semen and uh, currently or over the last uh, year the uh, average net merit bulls that we've used was uh, like a little over 900 like 920 something I think it was if I find that slide but essentially in the 98th percentile of the Holstein bull the Holstein bulls that are available for us to use and uh, mentioned it mentioned it in the past we uh, purchased all of our bull semen from select sires and they have a typically have a pretty good lineup of bulls and uh, the those bulls are also uh, averaged over a thousand uh, dairy wellness profit dollars uh, it was uh, yeah I don't remember the exact number here now I wrote down over a thousand but essentially what dairy wellness profit is uh, it's a combination of production uh, fertility nutrition disease resistance and then uh, longevity so kind of a an index that uh, takes a lot of uh, different aspects of of uh, the genetics of the heifer or the cow into that index and we're actually breeding based on dairy wellness profit dollars so every month or every two months when we get matings made for us there's a cutoff on dairy wellness profit anything above that is getting bred to sorted semen anything below that's bred to beef and then there is some there is a little bit of uh, give there if we have some red and whites that are below the cutoff they may still get bred to red and white but generally we kind of uh, stick to that uh, pretty strictly but that number will change monthly depending on how many cows and heifers we have available to be bred but uh, let's look at some of these uh, Let's look at some of these uh, responses to the genetic results and see how how they did as cows compared to what they were predicted to do. And it's uh, it's pretty interesting. So I don't know how well you guys can see this here, but we'll just look through a couple that uh, really jumped out to me. So we're looking here at uh, conception, first service conception rate, and then it's broken down by top 25% and then the next 25%, the next 25% and then the 25%, the lowest 25%. And this is based on what they what their genetics were when they were tested at birth. It's essentially showing that the top 25% has an 11% higher conception rate compared to the bottom 25%, which is a pretty drastic number. And we'll just go through some of these here. They also look at uh, scours and uh, respiratory in calves and there was a 36 percent reduction in in scours or diarrhea in the top 25 percent compared to the bottom 25 percent which again is a pretty significant number respiratory disease there was a 50 percent reduction in respiratory in the top 25 percent compared to the bottom 25 percent and then they also uh They'll look at milk. They'll also look at milk production and then transition diseases. Uh, milk production. There's uh, 5,500 pounds more milk in the top 25% compared to the bottom 25%. And I think this was in first lactation. I'll see if I can find that slide here quickly. I didn't write that down. Uh, yeah, first lactation cow. So that's uh, and these are real numbers based on their DHI results in our in our own herd. So at 5,500 pounds at the, the top 25% produce more than the bottom 25%, which is, uh, yeah, again, pretty significant. 25% uh, less retained placentas, 70% less metritis, 80% less ketosis, 30% less mastitis, 30% less lameness. So it's, uh, definitely paying to try to increase the genetic level of our herd 
try to get more cows closer to that top 25% or at least close that gap between the bottom and the top. The, the top group in our herd, I mean, they're, they're doing really well already. It's getting those, that bottom group, narrowing that the spread between the top and bottom group really is where I see the potential is. But it's uh, yeah, pretty interesting to uh, go through this report and uh, yeah, it really shows me, I mean, it show, showed me here three years in a row that definitely there's, uh, it's money well spent on these uh, good sires. And we have been using uh, Select Sires as next gen lineup here for the last, well, essentially since we did this first audit, because it kind of opened my eyes uh, pretty quickly to how important it is to use good bulls in the herd and to try to yeah, increase the uh, genetic level of our herd and that it really does pay dividends over time. The problem is it always takes so long for, for that to come, you know, to, to kind of show itself in actual numbers in the herd. It takes a long time to get that return, but it's definitely, uh, the return is there in my opinion. But uh, yeah, if anybody has any questions or would like to know more, you post them down in the comments. Appreciate you guys watching and uh, hopefully we'll uh, see you in the next video.